Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last session of our 2023 CSR Marketplace virtual program. We're very excited um, for this afternoon's session, Tackling Threats to Employee Wellbeing, hosted by E4E Relief. Uh, for those of you who may be new to ACCP, the Association of Corporate Citizenship Professionals is the premier membership organization working to increase the effectiveness of corporate social impact professionals. Um, we connect our members to the people, the knowledge, and the resources they need to enhance their impact in their companies and in community. Before getting started with today's session, I would like to just um, uh, do a quick plug for some upcoming ACCP programs. So our next webcast will be on September 28th. It's titled Social Investment Driving Long-Term CSR Impact. Um, so we do hope that you join us for that program. Registration is open on our website. We also are very excited for our upcoming annual conference, which will be in Denver this year on October 16th through 18th. We've actually re reached capacity for registration for the conference, but we do have a wait list, um, and we will drop the email into the chat for those of you who may still be interested in registering but didn't get a chance to before um, the deadline. And finally, our last um, virtual summit of the year will be our Impact Measurement Summit coming up on December 5 and 6, and registration for that program will be opening on September 21st. Now for just a couple uh, webcast host, um, housekeeping items. Uh, we have enabled Zoom transcript and closed captioning for today's um, program. We also do encourage you to uh, use the chat feature in Zoom to engage with our speaker um, and also with your fellow audience uh, members. And we will be taking Q&A throughout and, and leaving time at the end. And so please um, put in your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, and if you see a question that um, resonates with you, please um, click on the thumbs up icon so that we know to upvote it and answer it um, in the beginning of the Q&A session. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ashley Wilson-Oster from E4E Relief. Take it away, Ashley. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane. Happy to be with you all this afternoon. Um, so thank you for joining me. Well, let me see here if I got the slides right. Okay. Um, I appreciate you joining this session today to talk about one of my favorite topics. Um, I am Ashley Wilson Oster. I have been, had the good fortune of working at eFree Relief for the last five years. And over the course of my career, learning and considering purpose and well-being for individuals, communities, and business has always been important to me. Um, and so today, I'm excited to uh, talk about what I think is on the horizon for all of us. And I got to be honest, um, this week threw me a major curveball. It's almost ironic to be speaking about well-being. And personally, um, I'm on the back end of recovering from COVID myself. So um, please have mercy on my voice or if I cough, um, I apologize, but I really am. I'm on the tail end and, and happy to be here today and really got to firsthand experience what it means to work and, and try to support well-being uh, at the same time. So I hope you're here today because you're interested in the impact of well-being on your workforce and how their well-being directly impacts your business. And um, please do interact. I know it's the end of the day and the end of the conference, but it's so much more fun if there is um, chat or questions. I'm always happy to answer anything. And we do have some polls and I, I look forward to learning from you as well. That's the fun thing about the ACCP environment um, that I always appreciate is being able to learn together and share best practices. So before we dive straight into today's um, agenda, I wanted to make sure everybody knew where I was coming from. Um, every day at eFree Relief, we get to work with incredible companies around the country who want to provide direct cash grants to individuals in crisis. We provide consultation and administration for emergency financial relief programs um, to serve as a compassionate workforce solution and get support to individuals facing unexpected 
um, impact from hardship and disaster. So it's been our privilege since 2020. Uh, we've covered about 6 million workers around the globe. We've awarded over 240 million in grants and received 340 million in donations um, and create sustainable, equitable programs with many companies, hopefully some of yours that we're talking to today. All right, let's dive in. So um, I really wanted to make sure that we have the opportunity today to really think about how well-being and CSR connect. Um, we all hear and say it frequently how the world has changed the last three years. It has given rise to many new trends and including a new lens for the interest and significance of various stakeholders. Your people want to be part of something worthwhile and get behind something that they believe in. And your customers and investors expect you to behave ethically in how you treat people and the planet. So it's not only about turning a profit anymore. It really it is so important that you must make a difference and you must participate and be a part of leading participation um, for crises that are going on. And people make that happen. So they are the catalyst for changing for your organization for good. And it's not you know, it's not just an HR conversation, or it's not only a CSR conversation or an ESG conversation, it's a connected conversation. If we use the definition actually from the World Health Organization, it defines positive mental health as a state of well being in which the individual realizes his or her own capabilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So that makes it super important to every one of us. And we all know how much has changed in our lives and the lives of our employees over the last few years. And so many of you are leading on the forefront of what it looks like to, the corporate response should look like and continue to look like. And as crucial stakeholders, employees needs throughout every organization vary based on their role and responsibility, their home life and various other factors. So let's jump in um, with this idea of well-being. Uh, I found this, you know, I was trying to think about, um, Corn Ferry put out a, a, a report, a blog recently on well-being, and it really talks about the pillars. And if the last few years have taught us anything is that we can no longer act as though work and life are separate. And there's so much in our life that is connected to our ability to thrive at work and contribute to our community and improve service and business. So in this blog, the contributor said that there's four main pillars of that well-being, and that is awareness. So that is the degree to which or not we um, are aware of our own experience, the connectedness, how related we are to others and the world around us, and the degree to which we practice appreciation, kindness, and compassion. Some, golly, I know many of us would like to see so much more of this and are, are bringing that into our workforces. Um, and then insight, how, how much and how often can we cultivate curiosity and self-knowledge? And purpose, the, the degree to which we understand our values and our motivations that guide us through our decisions. And so these pillars of well-being are a part of everybody, you know, so many of your stakeholders' lives and matter to understand um, what is contributing to them. I really uh, liked seeing that, that from this, this is a Bain survey that asked global CEOs what they see as the primary role of their business. And 60% of them said that balancing the need of all the stakeholders or creating positive income for positive, excuse me, not income, whoops, sorry for that mistake, positive outcome for society. Um, and that's 85% of these business leaders call social issues, social issues, urgent concerns for their companies. So I, you know, we've all been a part of that shift and seeing that you, you have to participate in what's going on in the community and see where you have an opportunity um, to have influence, to respond um, the article suggests that applying a social lens to business can open up new opportunities for value that actually also really help the business, delivering real economically sustainable business results while creating sustainable benefits for your employees, for the customers, for the local communities, and for the society at large. 
So in my view, the state of the workforce is that we are in the thick of it, of navigating a new day with new imperatives. And we're trying to level out some of what we've learned um, over the last few years and, and prioritize the various stakeholder needs that lead to meaningfully connected places of work. So with that in mind, um, this positive setting about uh, well-being, let's look at what the threats are um, that must be considered by CSR leaders. What are the threats to, to um, well-being? And I wanted to first hear from you all. Um, let's see, I think there should be a poll. So what, what would you consider to be the greatest that threat to the well-being of your teams? Um, I'll give everybody a few seconds to fill this in so we can see together what you're facing with your employee groups. Okay, let's see these results here. So 33% work-life balance, 22% financial stress, 44% overwhelming workload. Um, that resonates and makes sense. So um, let's see what we came up with or what, what we've been hearing on our end for a while. Um, in a recent, I'm gonna start with the threat number one, which we would say is the economic conditions. In a recently released report from HR.com on well-being, it stated that 58% of companies say inflation and economic not uncertainty is their biggest threat. It's a threat to the company and to the individuals. And the International Labor Organization, that they have a global wage report that they put out in the last one uh, for 22, uh, 2022, 2023, indicated that especially lower income earners are most impacted by today's economic conditions with inflation being a key driver. Um, and evidence suggests that rising inflation is, is causing real wage growth dip into negative figures in many countries. So it isn't only here in the US, but um, it, around the world. And 88% of employees agree and say that there's a notable increase in financial anxiety. The, cost of living has the greatest impact on low income earners and their household. And this is because they spend most of the disposable, their disposable income on essential goods and services, which generally experience greater price increases with the non-essential items um, than the non-essential items during time of inflation. So the things that we all need for that everyday well-being, really we're seeing a hike. Um, so the income and inflation the growth being at odds is leading to financial um, instability. In addition, and this, this slide kind of depressed me a little bit, but um, we're going to set the scene. The latest from the Edelman Trust Barometer, it doesn't offer tremendous optimism for the future of economic anxiety. The lack of faith, I mean, and, and again, we all know this, we're in the middle of it representing so many of our organizations, but the lack of faith in so many institutions is growing. And this is triggered by disinformation, economic anxiety, class divide, government leadership failures. We're, we're at a dangerous time of polarization. And it isn't just the U.S. 53% of respondents for the, this Edelman survey say that their country is more divided than ever in the past. I wouldn't call it a silver lining, but it, it, it's a silver opportunity, let's say, that business is still seen as an institution that is competent and ethical. And much of that provides tremendous opportunity in the C-suite leaders and in CSR roles to improve economic um, optimism, to be part of um, being you know, the good news and hold forces that are polarizing us and dividing us, holding them accountable um, is part of the role. And many folks are really looking to businesses to step in at this time. 
So the economic conditions coupled with the lowering trust around the globe leads to financial instability. And financial instability directly impacts the daily lives of all of our teens and communities and all of us. And you can take in the stats here from, uh, it was a recent Betterment survey. Um, and if you don't believe that it's your company's best interest to care, 54% of employees surveyed actually believe that you believe you as they don't believe employers care about their financial well being. And together we must, because what that means for your organization, if, if not to participate, if not to care, is often very detrimental um, to the organization well-being, including the, the bottom line. So that's threat one. Let's jump to threat two, um, climate disasters. Many of you are, are very familiar. Um, the conversation is out there everywhere. And over the past 15 years, there have been 156 separate billion dollar weather or climate disasters in the US that have cost a combined 1.16 trillion in damages. Um, from 2017 to 2021, there were just 18 days on average between billion dollar disasters compared to 82 days in the 1980s. And I was, because I'm this is how I am. I'm always trying to think has it always been this way? And we just didn't notice, did we not talk about it? Is it media? Like what's really happening? And let me just be here to say when it comes to disasters, that really isn't in the, the case. And we know this because we're living it, right? Like in, in the last month alone, we have had wildfires in Hawaii, earthquake in Morocco, hurricane in Florida, typhoons in China, an unimaginable and devastating flooding in Libya. So globally, we are just seeing so many um, that are impacted by climate disasters. It says actually in a U.S. Census Bureau that 3.3 million adults living in the U.S. were displaced by disasters in the past year. And that, that has to concern all of us in 2022 alone. Um, you know, we have Ian ranking as the third um, costliest disaster in U.S. history. So as disasters become more frequent in a changing climate, vulnerable com communities especially find it more challenging to recover and too costly to try to rebuild or retreat. And, and we'll address that. And the cool part is, and you're probably aware that many company, companies are stepping up all over in this space. We recently um, just worked with the conference board, actually um, their 2023 um, disaster philanthropy report was just released. Um, I'll be happy to send, and actually I think we will send today to everybody. Um, and in that, it just continues to talk about the way that corporations will stay engaged in response to climate disasters. And you see the stats uh, again here of the participation from corporations trying to know what to do for their businesses, for the community, and for their employees during as a part of regular disaster response. So just to get our minds around it, because you know I'm so seeped in this particular threat, um, but I just wanted to share a little bit of what it's like um, for an individual to overcome impact from disaster. So first, let's just think about getting out of harm's way. Climate disasters immediately, you know, add unexpected burden on the lives of so many of our teammates. And so for evacuation, that for many households, the, the average cost right now is about $1,200. If you think about trying to get a hotel and food and gas and Again, we've seen the images where they're, everybody's trying to load out of town at one time and you run out of water and you run out of basics. And um, it really does. And unfortunately, sometimes during that time, the, the prices also increase. For many employees, that can be a big chunk of rent or mortgage, their utilities, groceries, or car payments just to evacuate from a storm that may impact their ability to be in their house for the next two to three days. And it's not just the cost of the evacuation, you know, but it's a reminder that we've heard the percentage that 56% of Americans are unable to afford a thousand dollar emergency expense. So it makes it a strain on so many families to get out of harm's way and then oftentimes puts them into looking for solutions that aren't in their best interests and have um, 
more consequences down the road. So say they were able to evacuate and then now they're thinking about how do we rebuild? What, and you know, so many of our friends currently in Hawaii are going through this. They assess the damage, so many have lost so much. Relocation may not be an option. And we know that home prices hit a new record high. And so they're up, you know, 14.2% from a year ago. And inflation has been holding steady at its highest rate in 40 years. And it increases the, the cost of everyday goods and services. And we also know and have seen so much about it this fall that the insurance, um, the insurance offerings are changing and vanishing in so many, many of these hard hit disaster regions. So the impact, let's see here, often ends up also being disproportionate. So overlay what you heard in the last few minutes of the community's hardest hit over and over the map, you know, on the a couple slides ago um, up in, in red should look eerily similar to the map right here. And that's because um, where we saw disaster events over and over and over again also happened to be the highest portion of the population that's living in poverty. And there was, an, there was a study from Rice University and the University of Pittsburgh that followed nearly 3,500 families across the U.S. for 14 years. And their focus was how disaster impacted personal wealth over time. And the results were striking. The white individuals who lived in countries with at least 10 billion in damage, they gained $126,000 in wealth. The blacks lost an estimated 27,000, Latinos lost an estimated 29,000, and Asians lost 10,000. And these differences occurred even though the researchers were, were controlling a wide range of factors, including age, education, home ownership, family status, uh, mobility options, neighborhood status, and county population. So these climate disasters are especially um, impacting folks in particular regions and, and um, into our communities of color. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and now for threat number three, mental well-being. Um, HR.com, again, this, this most recent report on the state of employee well-being, it talked about mental health issues that employees have coped with over the last year. And the top ones, many of you know, either from your family life, from helping contribute, from coming up with programs within your organizations, it was depression, it was uncertainty, it was anxiety, and it is stress. Um, and at the same time, 73% of organizations say dealing with employee stress in the workplace is a great challenge. Um, at the same time, you know, we also know that 57% um, that of employees were not able to confirm the existence of easily accessible mental health support services in their workplace. And 24% um, report the absence of these services. This was a Gallup that was talking about accessibility. Um, and 33% are unaware if they're even available. And I know, you know, for all of us that are that are well connected and trying to um, be a part of this solution, it is hard to make sure how do we get the word out? How do we make sure it is accessible and, and really bridge that gap to this real threat to employee well-being? The, let's see here, the stress is real and we all know it. Um, the same report that I was, was just referring to, it says that the, the negative stress is in the air and very few organizations feel that the programs and the initiatives that they set out to address the mental health are effective. And the disconnect is significant and it is showing up to, it's, it's significant to showing up how we want to for our teams because what the last few years proved is that we do want to show up. But there is some disconnect between the efficacy and the availability um, to how folks are really feeling in the workplaces today. So as we gather today, we know we are up against a battle of anxiety and loneliness in our workplace that is outpowering the sense of purpose, which boosts self-worth and meaning. 
And it's something I know that so many of us care about. And it's really challenging, but I'd love to hear from you because I also know that some things are working. Um, so what are some of the programs or initiatives that have been working and had a positive impact on your employees? I think there's another poll that will pop up and I can't wait to hear from you um, what you see is working right now. Okay, so hearing from some of you all, paid mental health days have been working, mental health insurance coverage, mental well-being apps. Interesting, I would love to hear more about some of those and then offering flexible work arrangements. It's a perfect setup. It's almost like you knew what I was gonna say next. Um, thank you. So paid mental health days and flexible work. That resonates, makes perfect sense. So our final threat and I, I debated putting this um, up because I, I know that it is, you know, similarly, it's one of our favorite things is that is the ability to have a hybrid workforce. But I also know that for many places, it's a threat to employee well-being um, and it's connected to the to the last threat of, of mental health. So we're in a place of learning these positive and negatives and and they're both here. So here I am at home right now, and I'm thankful that as I return to health, um, I can do so at home and I cannot infect other colleagues and I can stay connected to our work. Um, however, it's undeniable that uh, workforce is seeing challenges post pandemic to the connectedness and the culture. Um, there is no argument that we need human connection. There's no argument and there's no real substitute for that. Um, so the, we also know that with a hybrid workforce, the, the motivation is shifting. And sometimes you don't feel like you get to be in one zone all the time. So it looks different to stay productive and efficient in a hybrid environment. And again, I <laughs> try to look at that today. So um, I have literally he you know, today, right now, is I was thinking, um, while I'm sitting here presenting, my daughter is texting for her soccer clothes to be cleaned. We have repair work going on over there. And my husband is in the other room, you know, presenting to a team in California, which is crazy. Like we could have never imagined this for this. What does hybrid life work like? And how much does that blur the, the work life separation? And the truth is not very much. And there are days that that is awesome and days that that is really hard for us to stay connected to our work and to each other. Um, and ultimately boundaries between work and home help moderate some stress and provide focus. So we have opportunity here to make the most, I think, of hybrid environments. Our epidemic of loneliness for sure has been exposed. Um, and, and we all know this, that um, truly as once we got through the first few years and, and, and everybody was remote, we know that it really did have an impact on so many folks and trying to figure out the ways to reconnect and reconnect meaningfully is still something we're all trying um, to solve for. So whew, that was a lot y'all. And talking about the threats is my least favorite part because I'm an optimist. So um, I really want to talk about why this matters, why this matters to corporate social responsibility and why this matters to corporations to participate in the well-being of their employees. So I hope that the remaining slides are um, fun and an invitation to all. And please, again, feel free to ask questions or chat because um, to most of us in this virtual room, there's no debate if corporations should care about well-being and the threats that it provides to key stakeholders. But um, if we do need the stats to why we must all keep being part of the solution, it's really because of um, disengagement and lost productivity and turnover. Um, this slide relays the cost of an unwell workforce, which is tremendous. 
This is $1.4 trillion annually combined. And I know that we want to be the greatest places to work with a well workforce fueled by purpose and driven and productive. So the opportunity is with us all. The um, in the process of building purpose within every you know organization, it is totally critical to consider the concerns of employees. And according to a McKinsey report, the top two priorities of employees are contributing to society and creating meaningful work. Awesome. That makes the CSR space even better because that's exactly what we want to do. But there is this disconnect between um, what we've seen in spending and employee sentiment. So, for example, uh, you know, according to Forbes, the corporate well-being market is now estimated to be 20.4 billion in the U.S. and is forecasted to grow to 87.4 billion by 2026. That's a considerable market. So companies are spending heavily on well-being initiatives. But consider this, employee engagement is on the decline. So just 32% of full and part-time employees say that they're engaged in this work. So that disconnect is a space um, where we want to learn more and enter in. And we know the potential. We know in our heart that doing good is good business, that it's worth the effort to find and measure the right programs for your particular stakeholders. According to the Wellbeing Report, increasing these initiatives can lead to improved employee performance, um, employee engagement, employee experience, and employee retention. I don't think there's a company out there that doesn't want to invest in one of these things today, um, which directly leads back to how are we participating and engaging around well-being. And we know now, right? It, when I was just talking a minute ago about how everything is integrated, we also know that our solutions also must be integrated to contribute to whole person health and wellness. So this means you're thinking about caregiver support in a different way. Gosh, hasn't that changed so much in the last few years? We're all thinking about physical health. We're thinking about financial well-being. We're thinking about connectedness. So the benefit, uh, so what we've, you know, need to consider is that it's not a total win to like pluck off one area and come up with a good program, but how does your corporation participate in the various aspects of health and, and wellness um, to bring solutions that are um, contributing to every part of what these employees are, are battling? I think this is a favorite topic in the, well, maybe it's just me, but also in the ACC pace space that, you know, how are we continuing to find ways um, to be creative, to engage authentically, to problem solve, um, and, and to let there be multiple stakeholders in the ring in order to do so. So it's very cool to see that, that again, takes you got to think about multiple tiles that you can move around within your organization in order to create a place of belonging and connectedness. So people are, you know, employee networks are on the rise. Volunteerism has resumed. Opportunity and trainings are, are focused on equity now. And there are many ways to contribute to the belonging and connectedness in your workforce through philanthropy as well. If we look at just one area that we've spoken of a little bit today, um, and, and you know, for us as a partner in the financial well-being space, I can certainly say that we are seeing really thoughtful approaches to, to benefits, financial literacy, compensation, charitable grants, and access to resource. And again, it's not, you know, you're not just making sure that you have the one thing, it's trying to figure out a robust offering for your community to stay well financially. So what does success look like? And really, I, I know I could learn um, and continue to learn so much from all of you. How can we arrive at the unique offerings that make sense for your industry, for the finance industry, for the manufacturing industry, 
I know that it is an important time in many of your organizations, even right now, to consider your budget and planning for the next year of program and investments. There are cuts going on in places, and so it really makes it a critical time to think about what are you offering that is working? Um, and we know that we have to continue to be drivers of purpose-driven work. Um, Porter Novelli, who many of you uh, have probably worked, not heard of and worked with uh, or participated in their surveys, asked individuals and investors a series of questions on purpose and impact-driven organizations. And 75% of Americans say it's no longer acceptable for companies to just make money. They must positively impact society. And 74% of investors believe that the most profitable companies are purpose-driven companies. And 86% of those investors believe companies should work for the benefit of all stakeholders, not just shareholders. And that's a really cool part that I think we're trying to figure out together today. So, you know, if you were going to have a few takeaways from today, um, here, here's just a few maybe obvious things for you, but you, you, as you're thinking about your programs, you need to make sure that they're both operational and impactful. Are they really working? How can you be a driver to really think about the measurable difference in the programs that you're, you're um, helping to initiate and fund? Are you able to see difference in those who access your benefits? Um, I wish, I was trying to think of a great analogy for this, but it always reminds me, and I personally was so excited when organizations started offering everybody, you know, the smartwatches, the Fitbits, and it was the Garmin's and other tracking devices. And so what was really successful, highly operational, was that everybody wanted one and they could get them and give them out. Um, but what wasn't as successful is it didn't actually change the behavior of individuals to move more and start daily walking and start tracking more um, exercise together. So um, depending on how they could have, <coughs> you know, combined this idea of how they were going to operationalize and measure, um, what they really needed to consider was you know, was a watch really what people needed or did they need a watch and a walking buddy system or a watch and the freedom to take walk during lunch um, in order to really have that impact? So it is, again, thinking about a holistic picture um, and asking the right questions to find a right, the, the higher operation to higher impact ratio um, that will really help your organization. You know, um, it, e free relief, it has been a huge part, a critical part of our work to always be measuring the social and business outcomes of emergency financial relief grants. It is important to us to make sure that when we partner, you know, we're not just checking a box. And I know none of us want to do that to say, okay, we got disaster relief, we got them what they needed during that hardship, we got them what they needed. We want to know, did it have real impact on their life? And for us, we've seen four key areas of impact that we track and we report back to all of our clients. And that is around well-being, engagement, productivity, and retention. So similarly, Many of you know what your teams need to track that your C-suite want to see as key outcomes for the programs to determine if it is really boosting the stakeholder. So think about what those outcomes really look like and, and be willing to measure them regularly. Um, so let's, you know, taking the financial well-being train down one level further, it again, it's not that you're not offering the programs. It's a matter of, are the programs right for your employees? And um, there was a recent study from the Financial Health Network that found while companies seem to understand the issue and are taking steps to mitigate it, they're often falling a little bit short. So they made the points that, um, you know, 86% of employers consider themselves aware that their employees have financial health challenges. And employers are seeing evidence of hardship, you know, increase. Everybody, you know, everybody's aware that there's been an increasing demand um, and need uh, over the last couple of years. 
But the metrics um, to this extent, you know, this example is typically 401ks um, is how a lot of companies measure if they're, if, if employees are access, you know, have financial health or health related claims. And that's just a, it's a limited view on an employee's financial needs. So the most common type of benefits offered don't address many of the financial health challenges that employees actually face. So when you're thinking about your programs, really think about what can you do to better understand the need first um, and set up their response and metrics to um, exemplify that and to multiply that um, and to not have a limited view there. Also, it is so important and to know your key stakeholders. Um, I know that there are one million great programs to do um, and ways that we can contribute from walking to calm space to equity programs to mentor buddies to volunteer day. I mean, there are so many things that we can do, but it's really important to know your, your unique benefit to your stakeholders um, and who your stakeholders are. What does the demographic tell you about who you are trying to contribute to wellness on behalf of. Because the coolest part about the workplace is it, it typically is a melting pot. And the better you can know your organization's numbers, um, the better you can advocate for the programs to meet them. So, uh, you know, try to learn who your internal stakeholders are. The other thing that we would encourage is to increase cross-function understanding. And I know we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but um, this idea that so many departments are not in a silo within your organizations. And also within that, to be talking about what you're hearing and saying from the, you know, your, your peers and, and colleagues. Um, in the report from the, the conference board, it talked about employees as the leading stakeholder group in driving and shaping, in particular, disaster philanthropy efforts. And it cited the 93 cited by 93% of companies that employees were, were shaping those efforts. Companies may benefit from finding ways to tap into the collective power and enthusiasm of their workforce. When you actively involve your employees in decision making and volunteerism and supporting employee driving fundraising campaigns um, or skills based volunteering, the companies can really harness their workforce to make tangible and lasting impact um, on communities. And lastly, you know, um, it, this is huge for all of us, is when you know your employees, you've measured the impact, you've thought about the operations, You the, the piece that is really critical is making sure that you can meet employees where they are, but, I mean, meet employees, understanding where they are in life, removing barriers to access. And this is getting trickier because there are, you know, multi-generation work folks in the workforce. And so some individuals may want access to things, for example, digitally. Some may want to be able to pick up a phone and call or fill out a form and call. I mean, fill out a form in, on paper. And this is a um, really different approach to how do you make sure to help different um, generations of workers and their expectations uh, for how they could access the resources that you have available to improve their well-being. Um, there was a story about a, a family business uh, that we worked with, and they had a 401k plan, and they had um, one, two family members that worked in it, and one was a 21-year-old, and one was his uncle who had been there for a long, long time, and the 21-year-old, and he, he really didn't care about the 401k the same way that his uncle did, and that's because it's really far from his mind um, at that time. He was thinking about trying to buy a house. He was thinking about what trip he might be able to take, and so, you know, how do you think about um, really reaching your employee base based on where you have the highest percentages um, to get them their, the, the, the greatest well-being packages that, that, that you can um, and meeting them where they're at. 
And then finally, and this is something that I've been so proud to be a part of um, the, the larger CSR community and really see the end to um, the stigma for pursuing mental health or um, well-being support. This is something that we are all so happy and hope happens for the, the generations to come into the workplace that we are prioritizing and making it really normal that people might have a mental health day and that you're not just at saying, um, you know, we have an EAP that covers something. You're saying we have a therapist on site and we're not just saying that you should get a flu shot. We're saying we're offering the flu shot or we have the gym. How do you increase accessibility against so many of the threats um, that we've named here today? So I know that I'm at my time. I've talked fast and gone over so many things. So um, thank you so much. I don't know if there are any questions, Jean, or. There is. There's one question and I have a couple that I would love for you to weigh in on. Okay. Um, so the first one is, um, do you have any suggestions for our audience on how to persuade the C-suite to put additional money towards wellness initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I think it just, it goes back to, I mean, I literally have them here printed, but it goes back to things like these state of well-being reports and the McKinsey reports and really showing them the connectedness of, um, you know, your ability to, to give a meaningful and purpose-driven place of work um, and that that really matters and that it contributes to the bottom line. I mean, ultimately, if people feel connected to their work and really feel excited and have purpose there, they do a better job. They serve the customers better. And that is a direct benefit to so many C-suite because they should see that, um, that output in their, in their bottom line and in the way that their customers are, are treated. Great, thank you. Um, one of my questions that I have, you mentioned about the importance of removing barriers to access to some of these programs. And I was wondering if you had some sort of practical tips on how to do that. To say again on removing the barriers to access? Yeah, some practical tips on how to remove the barriers for access. That was one of the, the things you pointed out as being important so that you know, most uh, majority of employees can take advantage of these offerings. I know. And I feel like we're like in such an experimental phase. So many organizations that we talk to is how do you choose, you know, um, I, I think you have to offer more ways of, of getting the information for a variety of levels of abilities. I think you have to offer a different way to get information for a variety of um, generations. So whether it is digital or intranet or one-to-one -one sessions during your onboarding or, you know, it just, it, we've gotten so far from like, here, welcome to the, here's your pamphlet. You'll never see it again. Are there texts that can go out? We have some great clients who regularly like focus on one thing a month that they're talking about that's a part of their benefits. And a, a text goes out and is like, this month we're focusing on this as a way to highlight. And I think that's a great way if you could pick something and encourage it in different seasons that might remind folks that that is there and how they can access it. That's a great tip. Um, and one final question, if you'll humor me. Um, you know, our... Oh, I think the majority of our audience are corporate social impact professionals. In some cases, they have control over these programs, but in some cases, they don't. Um, and so what would be some suggestions to today's audience and how to influence if they, if they don't have the decision-making authority to influence a department such as HR that do? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like, my great hope is that it causes so much more collaboration from the people who are, you know, may have um, all the ideas and be out there in the community talking to the, the community partners who are trying to solve with the HR folks who are hearing from the employees every day that they would be able to connect to one another and, and share data, share ideas and actually um you know, collaborate and come up with 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 what they really feel like is a program that makes sense for their unique organization rather than doing them in silos, but also rather than only one person always getting the power to say, hey, I've really, you know, I've seen this working. I'd love to try it at our organization. Is this something we could do together? Um, and really trying to figure out how you bridge because well-being is going to impact 
it's going to impact all the areas. Um, right. So it can't be siloed and, and be solved well. Right. Well, great. Um, well, with that, I want to thank you, Ashley, for your time and your wisdom and sharing this information with our audience. I think it was really valuable. Um, I also just want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us. And um, final ask before you sign off is to, um, there's a QR code on the screen. Please take a picture of it. There's a link to our very, very short survey in the chat. Um, please provide us feedback on the session. It's very important to us and it helps us develop valuable programs for the future. Um, and with that, I hope to see everyone at a future ACCP event very soon. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon, everybody.